I'm Brian Garman, head of school, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 37th annual John Fisher Zeidman Memorial Lecture, which is an integral part of the Chinese Studies program here at Sidwell Friends School. Let's gather, please, after the manner of friends by holding in the light the memory of John Zeidman and his mother, Nancy, who passed away last summer. I would also ask that at this, our first public event since the Sri Lanka bombings, that we honor the memory of our student, <clears throat> Kieran Shafritz de Zoiza, whose life was tragically taken on Sunday. Please also hold Kieran's mother, Dulcy, Sidwell Friends School Class of 1985, and all the victims of the bombing in the light as well. Thank you. The Zeidman program has long sought to promote peace and understanding between cultures, a goal that remains vitally important to our school and the future of our world. Quakers have the audacity to believe that peace is possible, and the news this week has strengthened our resolve to create a more peaceful world. There was a moment when this program was threatened because of violence. It was after the Tiananmen Square protests. And Phil Zeidman was recalling with me earlier this evening that Earl Harrison, our head of school, stood up to tremendous pressure to cancel the program, to lay the program down, to cancel this lecture. And Earl made the courageous decision to persist, to keep lines of communication open because he knew that Maintaining faith when it comes to deepening human understanding was the only hope we had as a nation, as a world, if we were ever to resolve conflict. <clears throat> so in many ways, the Zeidmans were visionaries in this regard. So please allow me to recognize the members of the family who are with us this evening. Phil Zeidman, Jennifer Zeidman, Betsy Zeidman, and Ruby, is Ruby still here or is she doing homework? Ruby, <laughs> Ruby is back here. Um, so uh, let us please uh, thank the Zeidmans for their tremendous vision and generosity <laughs> and commitment. <clears throat> I learned something about the Chinese program as we were preparing for uh, the lecture this evening and that is that it traces its origins back to our 1979 commencement, when Nancy and Phil told their son that they had helped organize a group of 20 people who would travel to China. Such trips were uncommon in that era. Relations were just in the process of being normalized. And in fact, those who joined the cohort were among the first Americans who had been able to travel to China since the Cultural Revolution, if not the Revolution of 1949. For his graduation present, an unsuspecting John Zeidman received a place in this excursion. So we are pleased tonight to have a special celebration, the 40th anniversary of that gift, and to welcome some of John's fellow travelers, including Charles Hutzler, who, like John, became fascinated with China. Will those who participated in that historic trip in the first rows here please stand? And let's recognize them. Uh, alumni of, of the trip. So this experience was, I would suspect, life-altering for everyone who participated in it. And it was especially impactful for John, the Zeidman family, and ultimately for Sidwell Friends School. After graduating from Sidwell, John matriculated to Duke University and returned to China for a full year of study in 1981. As we sadly know, he, he contracted encephalitis during that time 
and passed away at the age of 20 in January 1982. A year later, Nancy and Phil established the John Fisher Zeidman Program in Chinese Studies in his honor, ensuring that John's legacy as a teacher would live in perpetuity. His openness, courage, and foresight continue to inspire our program and our students. So does Nancy Zeidman, who was also a brilliant teacher. She had a profound sense of wisdom, an understanding of the world that many of us do not. Part of her wisdom was, sadly, rooted in the earth-shaking experience of a mother who had lost a son. She rode the wave of unimaginable pain with strength and determination and grace, assuring that it delivered her to the beautiful shores of the family retreat in Destin, rather than upon an island of bitterness and isolation. She was forever changed by the experience, of course, and her grief never dissipated altogether. Tender moments of recollection and reverence often took place at this event when she and Phil would sit beside each other and hold hands as we recounted the story of John's passing and the legacy that this lecture represents. To honor Nancy's love for John, her family, and the community, friends have gathered in this space to learn about China for 37 years. They have come to show their love for the Zeidmans, perhaps more importantly. This love is central to what has made this lecture one of the most meaningful events that we do at Sidwell Friends. As uh, Mama Duguay, the principal of the upper school said as he walked in this evening, he loves this event because it repre represents the collective memory of Sidwell Friends and in many ways that's very true. Nancy never lost sight of what mattered most. She was full of life and energy patience and wisdom. By letting her life speak, she was a wonderful teacher to all of us. I'm grateful to have known her and am saddened that she is not with us tonight. But like John's, her spirit will always be a part of this event. Thank you, Nancy, for being a wonderful teacher, an inspiring person, and a loyal friend to Sidwell. Friends, could we please honor Nancy and Phil and all of the Zeidmans one more time with an expression of our gratitude. Now my pleasure to uh, introduce the director of the John Fisher Zeidman Program in Chinese Studies, John Flower, who will let you know what our students have been up to over the past year and is going to share um, some very exciting news about a new initiative. So John, thank you for all you do for the program and for our students. Well, I'm delighted to see so many friends here tonight and and I'm really honored to be able to report on the development of the Chinese Studies program as we continue to evolve the vision of the Zeidman family in the memory of their son, John. Uh, each year I get the chance at this program to tell you some of the things the students have been up to, and many of those things have involved uh, cultural exchange. So, uh, of course, one of the foundations of that exchange is uh, our relationship with two sister schools, and we have two wonderful students from our sister schools. Uh, from Beijing, our sister school, uh, Lin Yang, and Ken Yen, from our sister school in Shanghai. Last month, I was able to visit with the Zeidman Fellow, uh, Alex Bait. Uh, she is at Tsinghua University, uh, studying Chinese language and politics. So that was a wonderful experience. We've also had... Uh, uh, wonderful exchanges of students coming from our sister schools. So here you see a picture of 18 students from our Shanghai sister school who came and visited us in February. Uh, we've had some wonderful cultural exchange programs like the Guangdong mm -hmm. Opera and Dance Troupe that uh, performed for the middle school. The middle school also did a great mini-mester trip. You'll see some of the pictures in your program. 22 middle school students went and visited our sister school, Lin's school, uh, in Beijing. Uh, on their trip. Uh, and they also had a chance to go and visit other sites in, um, in Beijing during that trip. There are many teachers who have been involved in Chinese studies from all divisions. 
And one example of this is that the lower school, middle school, and upper school teachers all participated in the Freeman Foundation grant <laughs> to build a new uh, Freer Sackler Gallery educational website, uh, which was a wonderful uh, uh, experience. And I want to particularly congratulate the fourth grade teachers who have one of the most original, innovative, and China-centered curriculums anywhere. Uh, so the fourth grade has done a wonderful job. And uh, they've done such a good job that I'm also happy to report that for the first time ever, the majority of the fifth grade students rising into middle school will be taking Chinese next year. <laughs> We've also been lucky to be able to take uh, students to learn in China. Uh, this is a group who went on the China Fieldwork Summer Program where they had lots of interesting experiences, whether they knew how to bike or not. <laughs> but they also got to uh, apprentice with local craftsmen and silversmithing and wood carving, uh, playing music, and generally meeting with the local community and getting to know these people as real human beings, which is the spirit of cultural exchange. And I was so proud of the work that our students uh, did in the summer of 2018. Next summer, summer 2019, we have a new program, a summer intensive language program in Shanghai that will be led by my colleagues at the upper school. So we continue to develop new programs and offer new experiences to the students. Um, as Brian mentioned, we're delighted tonight to announce a new Sidwell Friends Experiential Learning, Environmental Sustainability and Cultural Exchange program in collaboration with the China Folk House Retreat at the Friends Wilderness Center, a 1,400-acre Quaker nature preserve along the Shenandoah River in Jefferson County, West Virginia. This summer, over 30 current Sidwell Friends students and alumni will work with craftsmen from Jenchuan County, Yunnan, to rebuild the China Folk House, a farmhouse that was rescued from dam construction on the Mekong River through a Sidwell Friends Venture Grant that I was lucky enough to participate in in 2017. And as part of this initial uh, cultural exchange, the Jenchuan craftsmen and students will work together to build a new Chinese pavilion. Uh, these are the plans that were sent by the uh, craftsmen. And the place that they build together can become a new school retreat uh, experiential learning center, and uh, a, a very exciting place. So we're very happy to be able to announce that tonight, and uh, stay tuned. It's all very exciting. <laughs> and we have an exciting program tonight. We have a very distinguished panel of journalists who will be speaking tonight on covering China in a new era of U.S.-China relations. The panel includes Charles Hutzler. Charles Hutzler is the China Bureau Chief for the Wall Street Journal. Prior to rejoining the journal in 2013, he was Bureau Chief for the Associated Press in China, and he spent more than two decades as a reporter in China, garnering numerous awards for his coverage of politics, the economy, trade, and other topics at both the journal and the AP. Charles is a graduate of Yale University and was a Fulbright Scholar at the National University of Singapore. Christina Larson is an award-winning foreign correspondent and science and technology journalist focusing on technology in China and on global environmental issues. Now a global science and environment correspondent for the Associated Press. Previously, she was a Beijing-based China technology reporter for Bloomberg and China correspondent for Science Magazine. In addition to filing dispatches from remote corners of China, she has reported from India, Myanmar, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, Mongolia, Malaysia, South Korea, Japan, the UK, Greece, Jamaica, and Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Edward Wong is a diplomatic and international correspondent for the New York Times who reports on foreign policy from Washington, DC, where he was born. <laughs> Welcome home. <laughs> he spent most of his career abroad, reporting for 13 years from China and Iraq for the Times. As Beijing bureau chief, he ran the Times' largest overseas operation and reported from China for nine years. Edward graduated with honors from the University of Virginia and holds dual master's degrees in journalism and international studies from the University of California, Berkeley. 
and we're pleased to have him here tonight. Our moderator for this panel is Susan Jakes. Susan is an award-winning journalist who has covered contemporary China for the past decade. She is the founder and editor of China File, which is the online uh, magazine published by Asia Society's Center on U.S.-China Relations. From 2000 to 2007, she reported on China for Time Magazine, first as a reporter and editor based in Hong Kong, and then as the magazine's Beijing correspondent. So we're delighted to have this panel, and uh, without further ado, I'll introduce Susan to start us on the talk. Thank you. Well, good evening. Um, thanks so much to Brian for his opening words, and thanks uh, to John Flower for inviting us and for introducing us to uh, the school's truly breathtaking Chinese studies program. We were uh, talking this afternoon about the fact that you know it's easy uh, sitting here in Washington, D.C. in 2019 to think that the study of China should feature prominently in the curriculum of any good school. Um, but to have understood that in 1982, that took real foresight. Um, and to have also tr transmuted such profound personal tragedy into something that has clearly so enriched uh, the lives of, I guess at this point, thousands of students uh, and through this lecture series, their families and the wider community in Washington, um, that really humbles all of us and uh, it deserves to be celebrated. So uh, I know I speak for all four of us in saying what an honor it is to be here, uh, to meet the Zeidman family and to be able to play just a very small role in advancing their extraordinary legacy. It's also just a complete pleasure to share the stage with these three outstanding journalists, uh, colleagues, and friends, and to have been able to spend the day talking about China and about the work we do um, with members of the Sidwell community, and in particular with the extraordinary students we met this afternoon. Um, we are calling our discussion tonight Covering China in an Age of Changing U.S.-China Relations, and I just want to say uh, a quick word about why, and then we'll, we'll get started. So the four of us arrived in China and came into the story of China uh, at very different moments. Uh, and some of our coverage has sort of overlapped, uh, but much of it has been on, uh, on very different topics. Uh, I've now been back in the US for 11 years. Ed's been here about two years. Christina got back a year ago-ish. Last year. Last year. And, and Charles allegedly is on his way back uh, to this <laughs> motherland after a, a latest stint of 24 years in Beijing. Um, but uh, so despite our different backgrounds, we all share the sense that the current moment uh, in the relationship between our home country and the country that we have spent these large chunks of our lives reporting on, um, and, and even China domestically, just feels un unfamiliar in a whole variety of ways. Um, it just feels like such a different moment. And so we're going to talk about how to understand this moment and what might be different and important about that, about it. Um, but you know, any time as a journalist you make a case that something has changed, you want to be clear about uh, what your point of comparison is. And I think there's a kind of a natural tendency to perceive and measure change in relation to a kind of original entry point. Um, for the people sitting in the front row, that's the trip in 1979. Uh, and for the rest of us, I think that's the first moment that we uh, came to China. So to start, we're going to do a kind of lightning round where I'm going to ask everybody very briskly uh, to sketch out when and how they first came to China, um, where they entered the story as a journalist, uh, what the biggest questions were that they were thinking about then, and what the challenges <coughs> were to reporting on it. And that'll give us a bit of a baseline, and then we can move into the present. So 
We're going to start with Charles, um, who can... Because I have the longest, earliest. He is the history. longest. Um, he is the, but, uh, the grayest, uh, although we the, learned he had golden curls on, <laughs> in 1979. At the, at the risk of not moving like lightning, I just would like to say that this is a particularly uh, meaningful and uh, moving event to participate in, having in 1979 been on the same trip with uh, John Zeidman and, and Phil and my aunt Ginger and, and several others who are here uh, in the audience. And uh, obviously for me, uh, this ended up being a, a, a momentous trip. I've now spent uh, most of my adult life uh, engaged with China. It's hard for me to believe that this trip happened uh, 40 years ago because uh, the memories of it are so vivid. And uh, when I take stock of my own engagement with China, I think of the trip often, and I think of John uh, and uh, all of the things that happen in life that you plan and that you don't plan. Um, if John uh, was, as described uh, in an introduction, uh, unsuspecting in, when he went in 1979, I was probably clueless. Um, <laughs> And, but I think that the, th the thing that I keyed in on, and I, I would guess that John did as well, was uh, China felt like it was on the cusp of some sort of change. It had been closed, it was opening, uh, it all seemed very fragile. What that change was, uh, we didn't know. And that is certainly why I returned uh, several times traveling in China and then the first time uh, to live in 1986 and I worked as a reporter for Voice of America and uh, at that point it all still felt very fragile that there were uh, reforms going on every time the government made a decision it seemed so momentous but it also seemed highly reversible and my Chinese friends would say to me don't believe that that this can continue. If a dozen old men get into a room, they can change their mind and end this thing in a day. Um, and, and so the, the questions I think a lot of us as reporters back then uh, were how far could they actually take this? Um, and would the Communist Party make the kinds of changes that would bring China into a more normal relationship with the rest of the world? Um, there were student demonstrations that were going on, uh, the largest uh, uh, of which were the ones in 1989 that ended uh, tragically. Um, uh, there were uh, it was tremendous energy being unleashed with reforms in the countryside where people were able to grow what they wanted to for the first time and make money doing so. There were complaints in urban China about the, high, uh, the suddenly high cost of living when uh, rent through your, uh, your work unit uh, given housing uh, doubled from something like one yuan a month to two yuan a month. Um, uh, and it was fragile, and uh, as 1989 proved, and uh, after the suppression of the democracy protests then, um, uh, China went into a little bit of a reversal in the 1990s until then there was a decision by Deng Xiaoping and others in the leadership that they really had to make a change. And that was when you came back. And that was when I Charles came back. Left in, for a few years and then came back. Right, and came back in, in mid-1995, and then and then the genie had been let out of the bottle and uh, the government had decided that to have a, a vital economy, they needed to give people some, uh, a, a, some control over their lives. Uh, they needed people who lived in the countryside to move to the cities uh, and take factory jobs. They needed to move people out of sort of very marginal uh, economic endeavors into, uh, into ones of higher value added. And this just unleashed a tremendous amount of change. And, when around the time that Deng Xiaoping died in 1997, there was a vice mayor of, of Beijing named Zhang Baifa, and uh, there was some reception, and uh, he was there, and the journalists all sort of said, oh, the vice mayor of Beijing is there, we all ought to gather around him. <laughs> and uh, we, so, we started to ask him, well, uh, you know, what could happen? Will these reforms be turned back? And he gave us, he was on the cusp of retirement, so I think he was speaking a lot more frankly than, uh, than officials often do. And he said, he said, no, 
he said, and, and, and the reason is very simple. He said, reforms are like an egg. And once you've cracked it and cooked it and tasted it, even if you want it to go back to being a raw egg again, you can't do it. And so there is a realization among, among power holders that uh, they could not turn the clock back. And I think for a lot of the time when we all were there, uh, a lot of what we were reporting on was the friction between a government wanting to be in control and the tremendous energies in the populace that they had unleashed. Yeah, I think that's... Sorry, 80s, no, no, that's 80s and the 90s. That's good. So I came in in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, a little bit before Ed, uh, when uh, China had just entered the WTO, the internet had just come to China, and there was just this sense of incredible possibility that there was, it was, it felt like there were so many pathways to all sorts of different kinds of, of uh, social change, you know, Supreme Court justices from the U.S. coming and teaching constitutional law classes on university campuses and um, exchanges between doctors, a huge uptick in uh, student exchanges, and then this enormous churn of three million, 300 million people uh, migrating from the countryside to the city and having their lives just uh, change so dramatically uh, overnight. And then I, I left in 2007, right before the Beijing Olympics and just before Ed uh, arrived for the New York Times. So I'll let him take over from there. So I um, worked in China from 2008 to the end of 2016. And I had some encounters with China before that. In the mid-90s, I went there to study Mandarin in Beijing. And then after graduate school, traveled around through the countryside in China. I was going from Hong Kong to India overland. Um, and so that gave me some contact um, with the far west of China and the ethnic minority areas there in the rural areas and gave me a framework for sort of understanding some of the changes I was seeing in China. Um, I'm a product of... Um, you know, the post-Cold War era. I um, grew up in the 80s and then um, in the, the 90s were formative for me. And that was the era of like American prosperity and the era when I thought, I think most Americans assumed that um, other countries in the world were on this sort of forward path where they would move from authoritarianism and state planned economies to both um, market liberalization as well as political liberalization. Um, the Soviet Union had fallen. Um, Eastern Europe was opening up, and I think we assumed, even despite 1989, we assumed that China would take the same path. Um, so I, my first foreign posting for the Times is to Iraq for, to cover the Iraq war for three and a half years, and that sort of colored, in some ways, my perception of China when I first arrived there, because what I saw was I saw um, America uh, having made this sort of enormous, uh, this colossal, probably the biggest foreign policy mistake of my, of my generation, um, going to Iraq. And then I saw China, which was economically on the rise at the time. Um, and the Olympics were coming um, that summer. Uh, China had dealt with um, an earthquake and had garnered international sympathy because of that. Um, and so the big question that uh, I had, as well as many of the journalists, had who were arriving then, including the ones who were arriving just to cover the Olympics temporarily, was what kind, here was a new superpower emerging on the world stage, especially after the US has set itself back during Iraq. And how would the superpower then interact with America? Um, would it present um, an alternative system to America or would it, was it still on this sort of like path towards these various forms of liberalization? that I had grown up believing um, would take place around the world. Um, the, there were some clues in 2008 to the direction that China would take politically. Um, there was a mass Tibetan uprising in the spring across the Tibetan plateau. I think the largest ethnic uprising in decades in China, which would soon be surpassed in 2009 by something that happened with the ethnic Uyghurs in the West also. But, um, but China, the Chinese security forces suppressed that uprising in, on the Tibetan plateau. Um, and they, um, they welcome people to come and see the Olympics, foreign officials. Um, but 
as soon as the financial crisis hit in late 2008, then China, um, then because China was able to weather that crisis fairly well with its economic policies, I believe that at that time, then the party felt a great sense of confidence in the Chinese system. And that, along with other events that were taking place around the world, gave China the sense that its system was built on a very solid foundation, one that could, um, was at least the equal of that of the US and that it would just be a matter of years or maybe a decade before China would be able to rival the US or surpass it both economically and politically. So I think that was the starting point for my time in China. I think that we saw um, much of this, um, much of what I saw over the next eight or nine years was a playing out of these feelings of confidence from Beijing, but also Beijing trying to grapple with uncertainty that came um, in this sort of post-Cold War era. So, Christina, you came three years after Ed, I guess. Uh, uh, well, I first came, yeah, I first came in 2007 did, on my first trip. I was at a journalism fellowship, and then in 2011. Um, I, um, I had different, I was more, I suppose, of a beat reporter in a way, I think. Um, so I'll talk about both sort of entry points. So my first trip uh, to China was in 2011. I was working for a little magazine in Washington called the Washington Monthly, and I had a fellowship through Johns Hopkins that allowed me to spend five weeks reporting in China. And at that time, um, the main question that I was focusing on was what are the, what are the costs to the environment of China's tremendous economic growth? Um, what, you know, what, what is industry done to the, to the to the water, to the soil, um, to, um, to people's health, and how prepared is China to manage that? Um, and second questions were, to what extent is China giving a space for civil society to play some role in environmental cleanup. Of course, in the United States, you had Rachel Carson and you had other people who were journalists who were critics of, of what had happened in terms of our uh, environmental situation in the 60s and 70s who helped try, drive change. And I didn't expect anything like that exactly in China, but that the government had created a space for um, the first NGO was Friends of Nature, an environmental NGO formed in the 90s. And by the time that I came, there were a couple hundred NGOs. They were small, but it was quite exciting to see the, the sense of the growing uh, space they had in some cases to bring attention to local pollution uh, problems, to have that reported in the newspapers. Um, the American Bar Association was running uh, legal training exchanges with some of these NGOs. So I was really focused on the sort of question of what role do ordinary people have in governance or could they have in the small space of the environment. Um, and that was a couple months before Copenhagen, which is of course the big um, climate change conference in which the world realized we can't address global warming without, without uh, being concerned about what China does, because China, of course, is now the largest emitter of carbon dioxide. Historically, of course, the U.S. is, but China, we, we have to work together with China in some way and other countries to solve global uh, environmental issues. Um, so I continue to report on environment and science as a key strand of what I covered in China, but in 2011, it was already a sort of a different moment. Um, the first trip to China, I brought this smartphone. I sorry, I brought this old school flip phone. Nobody had smartphones. It was great when I traveled along because nobody could reach me during the day because I didn't have mobile internet. Um, by the time that I came back in 2011, a significant mass of people had smartphones, and internet culture and internet business uh, was becoming a huge shaper of people's private lives and, and later, of course, of government technology policy. Um, 2011 was a particularly interesting year because that was the year in which Weibo, which was a big social media platform, sort of like Twitter in the US, gave this what felt like an unprecedented space for people to say what they thought online, to call out corrupt officials like this guy Brother Watch. How did he, with his salary, have all these Ro you know, Rolex watches and things like that? Um, and it felt it, it felt like um, it, it felt like a moment of possibility. Now, in the time that I was there, I just came back from China last October. 
the government, which had already had several controls in place um, on internet usage, the Great Firewall, of course, already existed, but the, the, the extent and sophistication of the Great Firewall really ramped up in the time that I was there, and you saw um, people who had posted things on Weibo be um, detained and forced to give forced confessions on the Chinese central television. And so that sense of an open, unregulated space on the internet where people said what they thought and tried to drive change, that closed at the same time, of course, Chinese business and technology has just you know, become an increasingly dominant part of, uh, you know, China's economy and the way that China relates to the rest of the world. So um, those are some of the sort of strands that I, I followed. And I'd say that in the time that I, you know, if you went from 2007 mm -hmm. when I first went to China to today, I mean, I would definitely list the internet and the changes in the internet among, say, the top three drivers of change that I saw, for better and worse. So one, one important change that happened, and this is going to take us into the discussion of the current moment, but one important change that happened shortly after you arrived back in China, um, which, which probably was also connected to the changes that you just described in, in um, ease of use of the internet, uh, was that China uh, gained a, a new uh, top leader. And um, I remember a couple years ago, I got asked to give a talk, and the title that the, um, was at the University of Virginia, the title that had been assigned to the talk was um, uh, Reporters or something, or something with the reporters in Xi Jinping's China. And, uh, and as I was on the way to this talk with another journalist, we, s we started talking about the whole idea of Xi Jinping's China. And you know, we couldn't Im have imagined that 10 years earlier you would have ever gotten asked to give a talk about Hu Jintao's China, or even Jiang Zemin's China. And there was something, um, you know, it felt wholly appropriate to talk about Xi Jinping's China. Uh, and that was a, a sort of a sign that, that something had shifted. So Charles, maybe um, you can talk a little bit about how Xi has been different from the previous leaders you've covered, um, and, and why and how you think those differences matter. Um, and maybe even a little bit about how he's changed conditions for reporting on politics in China. Uh, I'll try. Um, it's a, uh, a big subject. And I, I would say that with Xi Jinping, um, most of us got him wrong. Uh, this, the trend in looking at uh, Chinese leaders in the post-Mao era has been each generation is successively less powerful uh, than his predecessor. And uh, I know I thought that was what was going to happen with Xi Jinping and that in his rise through the ranks, um, the line uh, that we heard from many people that my colleagues and I talked to was that he was sort of a go along, get along figure as he ran uh, uh, rose in Fujian province and then ran Zhejiang province and, and up through Shanghai. Um, and it turned out that he wasn't like that at all. He came into power and uh, immediately launched uh, the most thoroughgoing and sustained corruption crackdown uh, that had been seen in China, at least since the early 1980s. Um, and this was very smart uh, in two ways. Um, first of all, uh, it, it was a way to put his political opponents on notice. Um, uh, although officially the government will deny that the corruption pr uh, crackdown is anything more than an anti-corruption campaign, it is in fact been a, uh, a political purge as well. The other reason this was incredibly smart, and that says a lot about Xi Jinping, is that it was incredibly popular and remains popular uh, today. There are a lot of, uh, of officials, there are a lot of business people who don't really like Xi Jinping, but if you talk to ordinary Chinese, uh, they think he's done a really good job in trying to clean up uh, the party. Um, I do think this was somehow um, uh, telling about him because uh, another way in which we had come to think of Chinese leaders uh, over the last 20 or 30 years was that they were uh, first and foremost economic pragmatists. 
And that has not been the case with Xi Jinping. He has seen his mission as being much more political, that at a time of change in China when the economy, which uh, had been growing uh, uh, by 10% annually up, and through, uh, up until about seven years ago, had begun a long slowdown, um, which remains today quarter by quarter. It, it smooths out a little bit, but the trajectory overall uh, is slower growth. And so for a party that got its legitimacy on raising standards of living, where was the future of legitimacy going to come from? And the answer for Xi Jinping uh, was going to be uh, one from uh, a renewed sense of national purpose and destiny, including greater prominence on the international stage. And two, it was going to be carried out by a reformed communist party that was answerable to him and him only. Um, and these have, uh, have proven to be very popular, uh, not popular with a lot of educated people and, uh, and business people, but broadly, uh, very popular, and uh, the, his detractors within the Communist Party remain uh, off balance. Um, for reporters, it's made great copy, but uh, at the same time, uh, having a, uh, a, a, a political power that is more uh, unified and organized has also meant that uh, there are many more uh, controls on foreign reporters. Uh, it's a much more difficult environment to report in. Access to officials uh, has dwindled uh, to uh, very little. Um, orders have gone out to, uh, to many more uh, institutions than ever were, including academic institutions where we always used to be able to uh, interview people that they shouldn't talk to foreign media. Uh, and uh, the police forces and other sort of social organizations uh, in China also have the word to thwart the reporting of, of foreign reporters. So it's made for a very uh, hostile environment uh, on the ground. Um, and the pressure is not only on our reporters, it's uh, on foreign reporters, it's also worse on our Chinese sources. So the people who do want to talk to us often find uh, uh, that they then uh, are uh, approached by the security services or others or uh, are lectured to by uh, their employers um, or their local officials about how they shouldn't do this. There's a, a great chill uh, for reporting in general and, and for reporting by foreigners going on. Um, Ed, so you arrived at this moment of what was what was commonly known as China's coming out party, as if uh, you know a country of 1.3 billion people were a debutante. And, and maybe you could talk a little bit about how China's role in the wider world has changed um, since that moment. And you know, as, as you sift through the perceptions about the Chinese government's um, intentions and goals, um, and maybe a little bit about where you come down on the question of what's behind uh, China's new assertiveness. Do you see more confidence? Do you see more unease? Um, and if you want to throw something in about uh, you know, covering the US State Department and how they see uh, China's expanding role in the world, uh, that would be great too. Um, so when I, in the, my, the first half of my time in China, like I would say up until around, 2013 or so, um, there wasn't a lot of coverage of China's presence in other parts of the world. There were some stories about China and Africa. I think there was, that was like a line of coverage that a lot of mainstream news organizations did. But outside of that, um, there just wasn't a lot of um, coverage of China's economic ties, its diplomatic ties to other parts of the world. But I think in the last couple of years, I'd say, we've seen like an explosion of stories along those lines. Like you see stories about China's investments anywhere from Greece to Ecuador to um, you know, uh, the Philippines or Vietnam um, in its backyard. And so I think that um, partly this is because for Western journalists, they're trying to grapple with the idea of China being this omnipresent country in the world, just like America has been, or the Soviet Union might have been in many parts of the world back at the height of its power. Um, the, I would say that 
One thing that struck me in my return to the U.S. and covering uh, diplomacy and politics here in the U.S. is that there's been a um, gradual forming of a consensus among sort of like in the Washington political class on what to think of China or what to say about China or how to approach China policy-wise. And that's to take their, that consensus is centered around taking a hard line, a confrontational approach on China. Um, I think that's rooted in um, this question, I think that the economists put on its cover last year, which is did the West get China wrong? Um, it goes back to the question of um, did the West, did Western analysts, thinkers and policymakers make a mistake by thinking China would change its ideology and its political direction as its economy grew and as, its, and as it interacted more um, financially and economically with other parts of the world? And I think the answer, uh, it's a rhetorical question that the economist is posing. The answer is yes, that they did get, they're, they're saying, <laughs> their answer is that yes, a Western analyst did get China wrong, that China now poses um, a direct challenge to the American system. Um, and so can we live with a superpower that is ideologically very different than the US? Um, so that's why you see this um, growing consensus in Washington among officials here that uh, the US has to compete with China on various things, including the Belt and Road infrastructure projects it's doing around the world. It has to compete with China um, in, um, on technology. Um, the US is trying to convince other countries not to let Chinese technology companies build out um, future generation telecommunications networks. And it has to figure out how to maintain military dominance of the Asia Pacific region. Um, I'm not saying these are my own, uh, this is my perspective, I'm just telling you what I'm hearing from people in Washington, among officials, many of whom you probably know. Um, and <laughs> so the, um, and I think that at the afternoon session, a student asked a smart question, which is, does the China pose a threat to the US? It's a big question that all of us think about. And my answer to that was like, China doesn't pose an immediate threat to the US as long as the US is willing to see military dominance of the Pacific and Asia to China, because what China wants is it wants dominance uh, militarily, militarily and economically of the Asia region. Um, and it wants to coexist with the US um, elsewhere in the world and sort of like um, compete, but not necessarily dominate the US in other regions. So I think the big question right now for Washington is whether it's willing to live with an Asia that is dominant in Asia, or with a China that's dominant in Asia rather than the US, which, uh, you know, it's ever since uh, World War II and what happened with Japan, it's felt the need to maintain that dominance in that region. Well, I expect we can probably get, we, we may have some more questions on that topic during the, the Q&A, which we'll start in a few minutes, but I also just want to return to the point that you made um, about technology, which seems like a, one area where there, there's a pretty persuasive argument that a lot of people got it, got it wrong. I mean, when, when I got to China in 2000, it was right, right before then was the moment that um, President Clinton made the, the famous statement that cens censoring the internet would be like trying to nail jello to the wall. Um, and uh, Christina, part of what you've covered over the past few years in looking at social media, EA, um, AI, e-commerce, uh, surveillance is you know, how, how, how wrong that, that really was. Um, so we now have a Chinese government that's not only more and more effective at controlling information um, within China, but is also um, there was just a big story about this on the front page of the New York Times today, beginning to export these technologies of control uh, to other um, authoritarian countries around the world. So how should we think about this? Um, we seem to be entering a moment of rapidly heightening concern. And do you think it's justified? Right. Well, I mean, I think to explain the early how we got it wrong or how many people got it wrong, the first debates about the internet, the public conversation in the US, um, and by extension, what we projected onto China was that the internet was this great space to trade information freely, that it was a, sort of a utility, of, that it was an information space. 
Um, but the internet is also, uh, businesses build the backbone of that, and the companies that the businesses operate in determine what is required for those businesses to continue to operate. Um, and very simply, in China, the companies that are the backbone of the internet Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, now you have newer companies like ByteDance. Um, in order for them to operate in China, they have to comply with a number of laws. One of them is that they have to have in-house sensors. So all these companies have a huge burden of manpower, people who manually go through and censor content, as well as using algorithms to censor content. Um, a, a recent law uh, required, a, a recent cybersecurity law passed in the last, I think, two years required these companies to uh, comply with police investigations, um, which functionally I think that they already did, but has a, a, legal, uh, a legal thing to point to um, if, if the government wants information about a user's history, a user's location. Um, so whereas in the US, for example, you had Apple, remember at one point, there was a debate where the FBI asked for the keys to uh, unlock an iPhone that a terrorist had been used, and there was a debate about the freedom of that. And there's no such debate like this in China. Um, and so um, w whatever, I mean, we can't peer into the souls of China's technology leaders, but whatever they think the internet should be, they have to play by the rules of the country they operate in. And so the internet has not become a space that that operates independent of the government. I mean, it's very it's very close, and and uh, it, so that's the big framework. But I but I wanted to sort of talk about on a little bit more personal level what it's like to sort of live in China and see the variety of ways that I think the internet is changing lives. It's not all dystopian by any means. Um, some of my favorite reporting stories were looking at ways in which the internet had connected people who had previously been isolated and felt this, this tremendous sense in finding a community. So for example, I was reporting in a mental health hospital in the city of Harbin um, where parents were, were visiting children who had schizophrenia. Which is a which is a terrible disease. There's no cure for it. It's a it's a it's a law. It, the onset is basically somewhere between adolescence and early adulthood, and um, doctors try to manage symptoms, but there's no there's no cure, um, and there's a lot of shame in the past and still today around mental illness in China. And so um, when I went to report on what some doctors were doing, they you know said you should talk to some parents about how they're coping, and these parents had a WeChat group. And they had someone to share these painful personal incidents about what had happened that they couldn't tell anyone else. And I thought, it's so simple, but this is, this is really incredible. And another similar story, um, there's a fellow who was a cop um, in, a, I think, in Hubei province, a little bit north of Beijing. And he had lost his job when his colleagues found out that he was gay. He moved to Beijing in 2011, and he started um, uh, basically a message board for gay people using a pseudonym. He got some investment, and then he found it a couple years later as social media was taking off in China, one of China's first gay dating apps, which has become really successful. It's called Bluid. And what a, what a tremendous thing that he's been able to do in, in, in his own life, but also in connecting people who had faced uh, significant discrimination especially in, in rural areas. And this app is used in urban areas, but in, but in places where there's more discrimination. So, so the, the internet certainly isn't all bad, but the things that we have probably seen most recently in, in the news are dark, right? So that the fact that mobile communications that we carry, we basically, we and especially, and in China as well, carry around a mobile phone. I mean, we're carrying around a tracking advice that tells exactly where we are, who we're sending messages to. And um, that has enhanced surveillance, it's enhanced policing, um, and it's, uh, you know, I mean, I think 
the, the most sort of drastic example, uh, of course, is, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about this, is in, in Western China, of course. Now's your chance. Yeah, okay, so, okay, I'll, 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 say, I'll save that, but, but even in other... No, 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 no talk it. about it now. Go for it. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so in Western China, an area called Xinjiang, where you have a population that's historically majority Muslim um, and are of a different ethnic group from the majority Han Chinese, the government has, for many years, um, worried about the possibility of social unrest. In fact, there has been social unrest. Um, but new technologies that have allowed, for example, uh, sorry, the, the thesis is that new technologies have, have enhanced and made much more brutal the techniques available to a government, which already wanted to sharply control this population. Um, so I have not reported in this area for the last year, so I might let someone who's more, maybe more directly report on it. But, you know, even two years ago, people were starting to install... Um, Uyghurs were required, the group that, the majority group there was required to install software on their phone that would track what they were looking at, the idea being, oh, what if they're looking at terrorist sites, but of course the uses of that were much broader. Um, the police contracted with uh, um, a private company to develop algorithms that would that would look at a variety of, of data, you know, on location, on how many times people went to mosques, to assess who might be a risk. People who were deemed a risk were detained and put into, many of them put into a series of internment camps. So it's not, in my opinion, that technology drives the policy, but that in, it, it, it enhances or accelerates policy. I don't think that technology is a decision maker, um, but that technology can more quickly allow the realization of plans than prior. So, but of course, once you put in all the surveillance cameras, how do you peel it back? You don't. Yeah, it's it's like the the, the egg. And right. And Xinjiang may be the extreme, but now they're beginning to uh, adopt some of these practices in other parts of China as well. So as, as a journalist, I think that with this, with this topic or with any topic, it's hard to keep it all in your mind because there are these, these incredible stories when I think about those parents and, and, and the children who they were seeing slip away from them and, and how, much, how much new technology enhanced their sense of humanity. And then I think about people who've been taken away from their families in Xinjiang. Both of those things are happening in the same country. And you know how do you how do you fit that into a headline or a single story? I mean, you, I only hope that when people read what I write or what others write about China, you can't capture it in all in a story. It's it's you it's you have to have a catalog of stories because there's all these different things happening at once. And you can't capture it all in a single 40-minute panel. <laughs> so uh, hopefully this will be the start of many uh, more conversations about all of these difficult uh, and very interesting questions. But now I'd like to give you a chance uh, to ask questions to the panel. I would just ask that after I call on you, um, you wait until somebody brings a microphone to you before you begin to speak. And then if you could stand when you're speaking, uh, that then we'll all make sure we can hear you. So questions for the panel. Yes. Oh, here it comes. Uh, for, first, the four thank yous. Uh, thank you to Sidwell for this extraordinary event, the Zeitman family, the reporting of this distinguished panel all through the years, and journalists globally, um, the hundred or so a year that die trying to bring the truth out. Uh, Graham Allison has written the Thucydides Trap book. Many have predicted that we will go to war with China. There are 15,000 nuclear bombs uh, that exist in the world today. Uh, China, Russia, others are developing the hypersonic glide, uh, Merving, all sorts of things going on. We have problems, points of confrontation, the South China Sea, Taiwan, North Korea, the list goes on. Where is this all going? Thank you. <laughs> it's a, it's a tiny, 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 tiny little question. Um, Ed, do you want to take that? So one? let me. I'll take a stab at the at the so Graham, the Graham Allison Thucydides trap. 
thesis is a famous, like in the last two years, it's become one of the dominant talking points when you talk to people about foreign policy on China. And um, I would say that from my perspective, that I don't think the US and China will enter into um, an armed conflict or war anytime soon. Um, the reason is because, partly the reason is because of the nuclear weapons you point out. Like deterrence has traditionally worked with superpowers and I don't expect it to be any different between the US and China. It worked with the Soviet Union and it'll work with China also. Um, in addition to that, the US and China are much more economically linked than the Soviet Union and the US ever were. And, the, and so I, I think that that's another impediment to the two nations getting involved into, in a hot war. Um, and we saw this play out, for example, in the South China Sea, like, which is what I was saying about the US wanting to maintain military dominance of the Asia Pacific, yet it was willing to cede um, territory in the South China Sea or these sea lanes to China. When China started building up artificial islands and putting military installations on various islands and these new formations, the US didn't do anything. It allowed China to take that, that territory and it hasn't pushed back in any significant way against China in that regard. Um, so I think that um, the two countries are trying to figure out how to exist side by side without getting into an armed conflict. That doesn't mean that there won't be other types of tensions or conflicts that arise, but I don't think that there will be a major armed conflict between them anytime soon. If I can edit, if I can edit Ed though, since I'm much more of an editor these days, I, I would say the, uh, uh, there is a, a risk around stumbling into conflict or accidental conflict with navies operating in close quarters to each other, um, uh, air forces not necessarily behaving always in the most professional manners. And there are guidelines to try to minimize the, uh, the chances for conflict. But uh, if uh, we were to have another uh, collision like we did between a spy plane and a Chinese, a US spy plane and a Chinese jet fighter as we did in, in 2001. Um, the, the public pressures within China on certain quarters for some kind of retaliation um, would be significant and difficult for the government to deal with. And Charles, how much do you think that has to do with internal factors in China and how much has to do with the changed posture of the United States? over the last, say, two years. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, to be fair, it had been changing the posture. Uh, when you talk about the US posture, you're talking about the, the chances for miscalculation yes. or... Um, yes. uh, and, the, and the Chinese government's calculation about what it's possible to... Um, what the risks are in engaging in certain kinds I, I'd, of... I'd much rather take the language. nationalism part of, or, uh, of that <laughs> question, which is that um, uh, the na nationalist sentiment within China has just been getting uh, much stronger uh, in recent years, and that is a conscious policy on the part of, uh, of the government. It predates Xi Jinping, but he has amped it up uh, significantly. Uh, Ed will be better informed about uh, whether the current administration's uh, posture or not has increased the chances for uh, some sort of accident? Um, well, I think that uh, in the last few years, the um, American officials have complained that the military-military ties between the two nations aren't nearly as strong as they should be, that there aren't the lines of communication that even existed between the US and the Soviet Union during the height of the Cold War that would prevent miscalculations like what Charles was talking about. Um, and in general, the National Security Council and certain other policymakers have a much more hawkish view on China than, um, than their counterparts did in the Obama administration. Um, but that said, I think President Trump is not someone who wants to enter into armed conflicts. I think that if you look at his history um, in the last two years, he's actually wanted to stick to his campaign promise, very similar to Obama's actually goal of trying to extract, uh, get the U.S. out of conflicts around the world. He, wants, he wanted to pull the troops out of Syria. Um, he wants to get the troops out of Afghanistan. And he's not eager to get involved in other wars around the world. Um, so I think that at that level, like at, 
I, if I, like, you know, if you're in President Trump's head or you're reading his Twitter feed or whatever and you want to try to predict how he's going to act, I would say that he himself would not sort of like advocate for a war with China. Um, and even people under him, I think, understand that there are big risks to that. Um, and that, but whether there's a miscalculation, I think that depends on whether they improve these military military ties that we're talking about. All right, let's take some more questions. Ah, here they all are. Um, uh, yep, maybe this gentleman in the blue shirt at the top. I'm going to speak for him because uh, he's got a speech difficulty. Um, I think what he was interested in asking about was the enormous social change from rural to urban in the last few decades in China and sort of the social, political, and psychological impact of this enormous millions of people moving from rural life to urban life. Another teeny tiny question. Who wants to take that one? Who is sort of? Okay. Well, I think um, there's a there's a terrific book. It's a it's a couple. It's maybe about a decade old now. Called Factory Girls by Leslie Chang, um, in which she follows um, the journey of of several young women who leave their homes in the countryside and go to work in factories in Guangdong, and. One of the things that that book and other reporting, including by, by folks here, draws out is how the change often separates families, that the, that the first big cohort of workers who worked in these factories would work there, come home once or twice a year, maybe at spring festival, and, and they would leave their children in the countryside with their grandparents. And so you had this... this you know, China, like a, a, so many countries, right, that the, the fabric of family life was such an important institution in shaping people's expectations, their sense of what was normal. It was their support structure, their healthcare structure. Um, and as families that had previously been very close have been spread out across the country, it's, it's changed things quite a bit. Another important social change, of course, um, has been the after effects of the, the partly caused by the one child policy um, that people, couples for a long time were only allowed to have one child. More recently, that's loosened. Most couples can have two children, but effectively, um, the momentum was already in place that many couples, for economic reasons, are choosing to just have one child. Um, so what that means is you've created a generation where you have all the hopes of both parents and two sets of grandparents put on one child. And you have a lot of resources and education. A, a much larger number of people are going to college in China than 20 years ago. Um, at the same time, the, the intense pressure, you've probably read articles about the Gaokao, which is like the SATs, and students who do crazy things that they think will you know, take weird pills and have heart monitors they think will enhance performance. There's also people who commit suicide if they don't get the scores that their families expected them to want. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, but, I, but I think that the, the change between urban and rural goes along with changing family structures. And I think people are still figuring out what, what, what does that mean. And if you have parents and the parents get old and you live in the city, do, you, do your parents come to live with you? Like, what obligation do you have if they're not close by you as they once were? If somebody gets sick, who pays for it? Um, so, I mean, you think about America, how much family structures have changed in the last two or three generations. Well, imagine that measure of change times 10 in China. And I think there's a lot of confusion on, on the one hand. It's great. There's much more acceptance in urban areas of people who are LGBT. Um, so there's, there's some, uh, I guess, sort of new, new thinking or new acceptance that comes with change. But there's a lot of uncertainty um, as well in that. I think that takes a psychological toll. Yes. Um, I want to make sure I'm going around the room. Yes, in the, okay, how about in the back there, yeah. Hi, um, I wanted to ask this question this afternoon during collection, but I got a back row seat, um, <laughs> so I've been saving it. Um, I kind of wanted to know your views on the 2018 um, Chinese amendment, sorry, amendment in constitution in early March. 
The Xi Jinping, the presidential term list. Yes, yeah. that one. It's a good one for you, Charles. Oh. So you've been in the succession watching business for a long time. Um, uh, I, I'd be interested to know what your opinion is and what your, and maybe, seriously, maybe and what your, what the, so, so in, in, uh, as part of Xi Jinping's sort of rise to unstoppable power, um, there was uh, a party congress in 2017 uh, in which uh, he was basically able to stack the leadership with the people that he wanted and to have uh, enshrined into uh, the Communist Party charter his own theory which was cleverly worded so that then he could reinterpret everything that had ever been said before by a Chinese leader in, in the way that he wanted to do it. And we thought that he was as powerful as uh, he was ever going to be. And then quite, quite quietly, uh, they went and changed the civil constitution, not the party charter, which contained term limits on one of his positions, that of state president. And it's actually the, the least important, least powerful of the three positions uh, that he held. He's the general secretary of the Communist Party, which is by far the most powerful and important position in China. He is uh, the chairman of the Central Military Commission, so he controls the military. Those had no term limits, but the state president did. And, and so in uh, February, March of, uh, uh, of 2018, fresh from this victory in the party Congress, they got rid of the term limits on this. And this was a, a tr to all of the Chinese that I speak to, um, uh, including government officials, uh, this was shocking. Um, in the post Mao era, uh, there was a uh, I think an appreciation and a consensus among many Chinese that having somebody with a lot of power who is in office indefinitely uh, uh, is a recipe for disaster and that Deng Xiaoping and other subsequent leaders had put arrangements in place so that power would be a little bit more diffuse. And China had solved the problem of authoritarian states that couldn't do succession. You get a leader in power, he's there for 10 years. Uh, before he's five years or so before he steps down, there is a, a, a successor who is identified and a smooth transition is worked out so that whatever jockeying for power or nervousness about the division of spoils um, would somehow be worked out over time quietly behind the scenes and you wouldn't have uh, uh, Chinese leaders trying to assassinate themselves or throw their rivals into jail and things like that. And Xi Jinping, upended this by removing the term limits. And uh, one way that people expressed their unhappiness uh, with this was that um, queries to services that uh, help Chinese immigrate to foreign co countries just soared uh, in the weeks after this. And it, it's interesting that you asked the question because it's, it's one thing that I hear from uh, lots of Chinese friends and acquaintances that still bothers them more than anything else about what's happened in the last couple of years. Well, sadly, we have reached our own uh, term limit unless we, <laughs> unless we uh, revise the Zeidman Lecture Constitution and keep talking to you. But um, I think on behalf of all of us, I just want to thank Sidwell Friends again for uh, inviting us. So three thank yous left. Thank you to John for your leadership of the program. Uh, let's <laughs> thank you to the Zeidmans uh, again for this uh, tremendous opportunity that you provide for us every year. And thank you to our wonderful panel for an enlightening conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, everybody. Have a great night.